Welcome to the Covered Bridges of New Hampshire podcast, where we discuss all things related to covered bridges in the Granite State. Here's your host, Kim Chandler. Hello, Covered Bridge people, and welcome to the podcast. Today, we're speaking with Warner historian Rebecca Corser about the namesake of the Dalton Bridge. Rebecca shares with us a history of the town of Warner, the Dalton family, and just who exactly the Covered Bridge was named after. Here we go. In this episode, we'll learn about the namesake of the Dalton Bridge in Warner. Constructed in 1853, the Dalton Bridge, like many covered bridges, took its name from adjacent property owners. The Dalton Bridge is unique in that it is the only covered bridge in New Hampshire named after a woman. Today we're speaking with Rebecca Corser, retired executive director of the Warner Historical Society. Rebecca is a graduate of the University of New Hampshire and took graduate courses in the Heritage Studies program at Plymouth State University. She was formerly the museum store manager and volunteer coordinator at the New Hampshire Historical Society. Long active in the Warner Historical Society, she retired as director in 2019. While employed as an assistant town clerk in the 1980s, she became intrigued by Warner's Black history while studying vital records. She has spent the last decades continuing to research the lives of families who lived in Merrimack and Belknap counties. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. If we could start by giving our listeners a brief history of the town of Warner. And I know that the community was originally granted simply as number one by folks from Amesbury, Mass. in 1735. What Can you tell us a little bit about Warner and how it was founded? Yeah, we were part of, uh, their plan was to have a, we were called the defensive townships. There were nine of us lined up in a row, stacked one on top of the other. And that was theoretically to protect Massachusetts from any French or Native American invasion coming from the north. Okay. So the proprietors were originally from the Amesbury area, and men came up to explore the area and built some rough log cabins. They looked at the <clears throat> waterfalls in uh, Davisville and thought that would be a good place to build a mill. And they would come up during the, uh, you know, late spring, summer into fall, and then go back to Amesbury over the winter. Okay. And uh, they were burned out by uh, the local Native Americans, the Pentecooks, who probably came upon their cabins and their work around the mill and felt that they were on their land. Exactly. Yeah. And so it would not really be until the settlement of the French and Indian War in 1763, a little bit before that, that people would start moving back to this area to to settle it. And in the meantime, uh, we were no longer part of Massachusetts. We were part of New Hampshire. And through another land grant, um, the rye proprietors were going to be trying to settle New Hampshire. So the rye proprietors and the Almsbury proprietors had to go to court and mediation to settle it. And eventually the Amesbury proprietors paid um, so that they would have the land up here. Okay. And so we were known as New Almsbury before we applied for our township in 1774. Okay. And I know the town was granted as Warner, presumably after the Portsmouth colonial merchant, John, John Warner. Do we know if he ever came to the area or was this? No, he was, he was, you know, it was a favor, a friend. He was a friend and actually a cousin to the Royal governor. So That was why it was called Warner. Mm -hmm. Although Colonel Harriman, who wrote the history of Warner uh, in 1885, had a hard time (laughs) accepting that fact and tried to uh, propose that we were actually named for Seth Warner, who was a a Revolutionary War patriot. Okay. I think because uh, 
Jonathan and Daniel Warner were both Tories. What was the economic climate like then? What did people do for work? Basically, they were surviving. Yeah. You know, um, you're coming to a wilderness. There were uh, paths created by the Native Americans, but, you know, they take, had to take the ferry across the river in Kentuckook. Uh They had to clear a certain amount of land. They had to build a rude log cabin. They eventually would have to settle a minister. Again, they would come up sometimes during the, the favorable months and then go back home um, during the winter months. So they say it took, you know, five to 10 years before they were actually building small capes mm -hmm. made out of milled material. Mm -hmm. So you had to have a garden. You probably had a cow for milk, maybe a couple of sheep, but really it was a lot of hard work. Mm -hmm. And oh in 1760, goodness. there were only 262 families here. No, 262 people. Sorry. In the first Daltons came to Warner about 10 years after the town was granted when Isaac Dalton came here from Salisbury, Mass. in 1784. And Isaac was born in 1761 in Amesbury, and he served in the Revolutionary War in 1777 when he was 16 years old. What do we know about Isaac? Okay, so I have for Isaac that... Um... He was born in 1761 in Salisbury, Mass., which is okay. quite next door to Amesbury. Yep. And he did did, deserve, did serve in the American Revolution when he was 16 years old. And part of the time of his service is contributed to Massachusetts. But in the later years, he's credited to the state of New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And again, I would have to go back. Next time I go to Nashua, I will check the deeds to find out when he actually purchased his land up here. But historically, people have said he came between 1774 and 1784. Okay. Do we know if, if he received a pension? Yes, he did. And his uh, second wife, Judith, also received his pension. Okay. Okay. And his first wife was Eleanor Merrill, and they right. married... In 1784, and it seems like they moved up shortly after they were married, perhaps. Right. You know, I think maybe by then, maybe he had uh, built something, a shelter that they could be living in mm -hmm. when they're up here. Mm -hmm. Do we know where they settled? Yeah, they settled uh, in an area of Warner that we call the Minks, uh, on Milk Hill, Mink Hill Lane, which for people who are familiar with the area, it would be on the road to Warner's second ski toe. And he eventually had a nicely framed house. Uh, he worked as a farmer, but his occupation was a tanner. So he had a tanning yard with vats for soaking the hides. Um, and then they would have to be stretched. And then they were usually shipped to Boston by wagon. And he also served as a deacon. Do we know which church that was? It's going to be the Congregational Church. Okay. So he's here for the first uh, three ministers, Reverend William Kelly, Reverend John Woods, and then Reverend Jubilee Wellman. Now, the Congregational Church was going through a difficult time in the sense that in 1766 and in 1770, they had a log cabin and then a small church built at what we call the Parade Ground Cemetery. And that was on the southern side of the Warner River. And then people were settling in Warner and wanting to move the church across the river into what we now know as Lower Warner. And that was a really big to do, a lot of dissension. Mm -hmm. They had numerous meetings where they would decide it was going to stay at the Parade Ground and then they'll call another meeting and it was going to be moved across the river. And then they had to have media meteors from out of town, uh, mediators, sorry. Wow. Uh, come and listen to the arguments and make a decision. They eventually decide to move it across the river uh, into Lower Warner, which is nearer where the Dalton family would eventually settle. So he was a deacon during this whole process. 
What was the incentive to move the church? Was it closer to the new town center? Right. Lower Warner would have would eventually become until the village of Warner, uh, sort of like the central location. There were there was a tavern, there was a store, there was a, a big contingent of families now living in the in the lower Warner, Denny Hill section of Warner. And they just made their argument that they wanted to move it into a more central, what they considered a more central location. Isaac and Eleanor had at least six children, and including twin boys. What, yes. Do we know anything about his children? Um, well, Samuel's going to be the firstborn. And there's a question about whether he was born in Warner or Grafton, although I think it's going to be Warner. And he was married in 1820 to a woman by the name of Judith Brown. And they end up moving to, they're in Wilmot in 1850. Actually, I should back up. His first first wife would die before 1850 because he marries uh, Miriam Kimball from Lebanon in 1846. And in Wilmot, they're in Warner and he's farming and he dies two years later. And then he has a daughter, Hannah, who would marry uh, John Stewart. And they lived up in the Minks above Cunningham Pond. And tragically, she's killed by being thrown from a wagon when she's uh, 42. But they would have had, uh, I think, five children before her death. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's going to be the twins, John or Jonathan and Isaac Jr., both of them would end up moving to Ohio, which was, was not unusual. The Erie Canal had gone through. There were people moving to Vermont, New York, and mm -hmm. then pushing out to Ohio. He becomes a doctor, mm. and both of them have families and end up being buried out there in Ohio. Then they seem to have da a daughter, Eleanor, who I only found through baptismal records, she was baptized in 1807. She's in the 1810 census, but she doesn't show up after that. So I think she died as a young child. Mm -hmm. And then I believe their last child is Nancy, who marries Samuel Collins um, from Warner. And she, too, ends up moving to uh, Martinsville, Ohio, mm -hmm. and dying in 1843. So it's interesting that uh, three of the children end up moving to Ohio. And I haven't looked to see how closely the towns that they ended up in are to each other, but they may have been near each other. So in 1825, Isaac bought one and three quarter acres from Richard Morrill and the same year built a Cape house on this property. And that was on Old Main Street? Yes. And then five years later, in 1830, he purchased another one and a half acres uh, that was next door from John Foster. Mm -hmm. Do we do we know why he wanted to move his, his family? Well, he's 66. He's 66 years old at that point. I bet he had given up tanning at this point and moving to the village would be easier. He'd be yeah. closer to services that he might need. And I think he bought the one and a half acres just to expand his property. Is is that house there still? Uh, yes, it is. He would have lived in the L part of the house. Uh, this is on Old Main Street. Um, at a later point, a colonial was attached to the front of the L. Okay. But the L is still there. Four years later, in September 1829, his wife Eleanor died at age 66. Mm -hmm. do, do we know how she died? No, I don't know. At that point, they really weren't putting the cause of death on the death certificates. No. And six, so six months later, he married Judith Sawyer Hoyt. And was it typical at the time for men to remarry so so quickly? Yeah. Um, a lot of times it was more quickly if they had young children that needed to be taken care of. But, you know, it's also a matter of convenience. They live next door to each other okay. and probably had become friends. And she was born in 1772. Was she born in Warner or was she born somewhere else? I couldn't she was, she was born in Warner to okay. Joseph and Judith Kelly Sawyer. Yeah. Okay. And she was also married before. So she married John Hoyt. Yes. And it looks like 
his brother, Joseph, was married to her sister. Do we know anything? Do we know much about the Hoyts? Yes, they did marry sisters. And the Hoyts were um, living in Warner, but Judith and John end up living in Salisbury after the marriage because that's where their children are born. I think John actually died in Salisbury, but he's, he's buried here in Warner at the Prairie Ground Cemetery. Judith and John had, I don't know, how many children did they have? Do we well, know? That's, a good, that's a good question. <laughs> they ended up with two living daughters, um, Lois and Abigail, but it seems that they may have had three boys, Jonathan, Moses, and John, who all died young, like less than three years old. Hmm. That's terrible. Well, you know, there were no antibiotics then. I, I know. So they got smallpox, diphtheria, consumption. So I know Abigail died in 1846, and... But Lois seemed to have an interesting life. What do we know about Lois? Yeah, Lois is interesting. In uh, 1836, she marries Edward Johnson, who was a minister. I think who would receive some of his training at Yale. And they make the decision to go to what we now what is called San, the Sandwich Islands, which is Hawaii, mm -hmm. and they were part of that early Christian movement to set up missionaries um, on the island. And they had, I think, six or seven children. And she lives until 1891. She lives longer than her husband. It would be nice to know if there was any letters anywhere that she, you know, corresponded with her mother. That, I'm yeah. sure they, yeah. Did, did she ever come back to Warner or did they stay in Hawaii? No, she came back. I, I find information that she came back to the West Coast, to California at one point. But to my knowledge, she was never back here in Warner. So John died in 1814 and he was only 42 years old, leaving right. her a widow for the first time. Right. And she was single for 15 years. Yes. Which is I, a long time. Yeah, it's interesting because she had young girls. But um, she came back to Warner. She bought property um, on the corner of what we now called Old Main Street and Denny Hill and had a home there. She would not have been very far from her parents living in this location. So maybe they were, maybe her family was helping out with um, child care. I'm not sure. And how, how typical was it for a woman to buy property? during this time? Well, it's more typical if you're a widow or if you're unmarried. She would have had some money probably from if from the estate of her husband, mm -hmm. you know, selling the property in Salisbury or whatever. She could have taken in, pe women took in piecework to make money as well. I don't know if she did that, but that would not be unusual. She gets married again for the second time, and eight years later, he passes away yeah. um, in 1838 at the age of 77, and seemingly left all of his property to Judith. And is that was that also typical? Because typically I've seen that they would leave their property to their sons. Well, none of his children were here right at that moment. When Judith dies, she does leave items to Samuel child of Isaac's first wife, okay. like the family Bible, some furniture, that type of thing. The following year, she purchased land from John Foster, which she bought two and a half acres on Main Street at the junction of Joppa Road. And that's where the covered bridge is today, correct? Yes. Yeah. And so it seems like she probably paid for that through. Well, it could have been a through the sale of her first home that she had at the junction of Old Main and Denny Hill. She was also getting a pension. I yep. think it was $20 a month. And I think when she purchased this land, the deed, I look back at the deed, and the deed does not describe a building being on the property at that time. Okay. So she may have had the house built. She didn't sell her Main Street house, I don't think, until 1846, so she probably... 
I'm assuming, built the, bought the property and built a home. Right. So she may have been renting the house and getting an income from that. Her home was down by the river where there had been a previous wooden bridge. Yes. And what I what I love about the references to the Dalton Bridge, as it's now called, um, and it says, in 1852, the town voted, quote, to build a good bridge near Mrs. Dalton's, cross the river in place of a bridge carried away. And I, I love the reference to her. Yes. I, I, I've never seen that in any other town record as a reference to a female. Right. So this this brings me to a little story in that I always assumed that it was named for Isaac Dalton until Howard Kirchner, who lives in the house that Judith lived in, came to me with his argument that he felt it would have been named for Judith because Isaac never lived at that house where Judith lived and that the references in 1851 about building the bridge says near Mrs. Dalton or near Widow Dalton. Right. So that kind of makes you say, huh. Right. It probably was named for Judith Dalton. Exactly. Exactly. And the bridge was constructed in 1853. So she, she would have seen it. She would have seen it. She was living there. Yep. Do we know about her life after she moved there? In the 1860 census, She's 87, and Mary Gilmore is living with her, and she's a seamstress. Yeah, in 1850, right around the time the bridge is going to be built, she's 78. Her personal estate was $450. And Mary Gilmore, who was the daughter of her sister Hannah, so it would be her niece, is living with her as well as a woman by the name of Nancy Davis. And I'm not sure. If Nancy Davis is a relative, I haven't been able to determine that. But Nancy Davis is going to pass away before the next census because Mary would be living with her. And then in 1863, Mary died, which left Judith, who would have been uh, 89 about that time. And Judith would live until 1865. And in her will, she leaves Samuel Dalton a Bible, the writing desk, a bookcase, and a portrait of his father. She leaves the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions $50, probably in memory of her uh, daughter, Lois, mm -hmm. who's still living at that time, so it wouldn't be in memory of. But Right. Um, and then the Warner Congregational Society, $50, the interest annually to be used for paying the minister. And then she leaves the remainder of her estate, both personal and mixed, to be held in trust for her daughter, Lois. And her trustees are to sell after her death her home and anything that was worth selling. And those monies would be conveyed to her daughter, Lois, in Hawaii. I wonder where that portrait of Isaac is today. Uh, me too. Wow. Wouldn't you love to have that? Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to know where it is and who, who painted it. That's the other thing. Oh, that would be amazing. Yeah. Are there still Dalton descendants in Warner? Not to my knowledge. Uh, but the Dalton Bridge is always, I've just always felt drawn to it. There's something about it that I just really like. What is it? And, and Warner has two covered bridges, which is. Right. We have the Waterloo. A real treasure. Mm -hmm. what, what, is, what does it mean to you to have two historic covered bridges in your community? Well, I think it's really important because we have lost a bunch of covered bridges in mm -hmm. Warner, and one was sold away in the 1960s, the Bagley Bridge, mm -hmm. um, which has now been reconfigured. The, the Grayton family bought it and held it yeah. for a long time in pieces, and now it's in North Carolina, I think, mm -hmm. and, and has been rebuilt. So I think it's important that we have these bridges and Warner is celebrating their 250th birthday next year in 2024. We've commissioned Jim McLaughlin to make four wooden signs with the name of the bridges on it. So it'd be on either end of the bridge. One would be for Dalton Bridge and the other would be oh, for the wonderful. Waterloo Bridge. Yeah, so we'll have an unveiling next year for those. The Dalton Bridge and the Waterloo Bridge are have been photographed numerous times. 
mm-hmm. you know, and people swim uh, at the Dalton Bridge. They fish both at both bridges. And it's just uh, part of the community. And both bridges are up high. I mean, the, the Warner River has flooded at times and has flooded the road as you approach the bridge from Main Street. Mm-hmm. And has flooded the land to the left, to the right of the bridge, mm-hmm. on the other side. But the bridge is high enough, so it's protected. I continue to be impressed that the Dalton Bridge was named after a female, and that probably, I don't know, probably doesn't matter to as many people as it does to me. But I just, I think it's really special for something from 1853 to be referred to for a woman who women were often forgotten. They were. And I think through, over time, people have just referred to it as the Dalton or the Joppa Bridge and just assumed that it was named for Isaac. So mm-hmm. it's kind of neat to be able to talk about the fact that hmm, probably it wasn't. Probably it was named for Judith. Well, thank you so much for speaking to me today. You're welcome. Covered Bridges of New Hampshire is created by me and recorded in Hancock, New Hampshire. The song Old New Hampshire was arranged and performed by Josh Black. The introduction is courtesy of Greg Kretschmar. This podcast is a companion to my book, Covered Bridges of New Hampshire. You can find out more about the book, the podcast, blog posts, upcoming events, and an interactive covered bridge map at coveredbridgesnh.com. You can also follow us on Facebook Instagram, and Twitter at Covered Bridges of New Hampshire. Please rate, review, and subscribe to or follow the podcast on Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Kim Chandler. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.